This podcast is brought to you by Mapper Forward's new Patreon community, the Global Coffee Think Tank. Check the show notes or head to patreon.com forward slash Mapper Forward to find out how you can become a member today. Dr. Sharada Krishna, welcome back to the Daily Coffee Pro. It's great to have you here for episode four out of five of our series talking about the Crop Trust. Welcome again. Thanks for having me. We, we are talking today about the state of coffee crops around the world. So there's a lot of talk right now about Brazil having gone through frost in 2021 and drought in 2020 and 2021. We've just recently had threats of frost in May in Brazil. They happened, but they were much milder than they were last year. Um, Brazil being the number one producer of coffee around the world, this presents uh, an issue uh, for yield. Then we look at what's happened with the floods and the constant rain in Colombia, which have reduced crops. We've got the economic ramifications of what's been going on with regards to, uh, you know, producers just seeing the the price crisis from a few years ago just deciding to cut their crops down because it's cheaper not to grow them than to sell them at a loss so it seems that coffee crops around the world have a lot of mitigating factors determining their long-term viability what's the state do you think of of coffee crops around the world yeah, uh, you know, coffee is one of the crops that has been highly impacted by climate change. And it is not, you know, there are climate change deniers out there, but you can see firsthand mm. the impact that it is having on coffee and coffee growers. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, drought, uh, uh, frost in, uh, uh, frost in uh, Brazil, uh, and uh, hurricanes, and it's also going to be, it's the unpredictability of it is right. the biggest factor because, you know, every year there may be a drought and, you know, you could have something, but uh, but you don't know this, what the severity is going to be. And it has become more unpredictable and more severe mm -hmm. and for extended, more extended periods of time. And I personally, in my own farm in Jamaica, the, you know, the drought, every summer I'm worried about drought. And uh, you could say that irrigation is an option but many of the coffee growing regions are in hilly areas, which doesn't make it conducive for uh, putting in irrigation systems because then it's going to lead to erosion, soil erosion and uh, loss of topsoil. And uh, so, you know, there are some ways to mitigate, but I think we really need to bring science in and looking at the genetics of the crop and breeding for many of these factors like resistance factors or drought tolerance factors. So that is where we really need to do a lot of work. Because as you said in the last episode, it's not like we can just store seeds for coffee no. and just go and try them in a whole bunch of different places and see what happens. It's not the way yeah. that it works, right? No, no. So that's where the genetic diversity of the crop comes into play, where we are looking at the uh, diversity of the crop within the species as well as outside of the species within the same genus that we need to tap into those resilient uh, genes that can confer these adaptations to a cultivated coffee. Will we see a shift in the favoured species of coffees um, as we start to see climate change and things like coffee leaf rust start to take uh, have greater impacts on on coffee crops around the world do you think that we'll start to see let's say robusta being more favored as as the consumer um preference oh yes i think uh you know i mean whether the consumer preference is that or not if the growers because that is all that the growers can grow then that is what we will as consumers will have to adapt to because consumers also need to adapt our taste to different variety, different species of coffee. Because if a farmer cannot grow Arabica coffee and Robusta is the only one that they can grow, they are definitely going to switch to a different crop. Otherwise they may completely abandon coffee to go to a different crop. That would lead to more shortages of right. coffee. And more and more consumers are, the demand is going up. 
So we really need to have production to keep up with the demand. Now, to ask a direct question, is the supply of coffee legitimately under threat? Because we've got two sides of the argument happening in the coffee media. Uh, We've got people saying this is just a way to drive the price of the sea market up by saying that there's coffee shortages. And then on the other side, there are usually a lot of producers that are saying we've got a problem. We need people to take notice. Where is it, do you think? We do have a problem. We do have a problem because, um, you know, the uh, Brazil, uh, the productivity has really, I mean, the so uh, eventually we may be able to make up, but uh, you know, coffee is going to fluctuate. That's what is going to happen mm-hmm. is because we can't predict what is going to happen with regards to climate. So the frost that impacted all the coffee in Brazil. So Brazil's productivity is going to go down for at least the next three years because if the coffee trees have died or they had to be cut back because of the frost, it's going to take three to five years for them to get a crop out of that. Uh, so at least for the next few years, the Brazilian uh, crop is going to be low and, and the same in Colombia. And I can personally say for my own farm, when I uh, last year when it was blooming and it was going into fruit production, I thought I was going to get a really good crop. Mm-hmm. And towards the end of the season, we got a, during the towards the end of the harvesting season, the last month, we got a severe infection of coffee leaf rust. Oh, no. And so Sorry. at that time... As a farmer, I have to make the decision, do I let the rust take care of, of, just leave the rust and wait for the coffee fruits to ripen and harvest the fruits? And mm-hmm. then I'm sacrificing the plant? Or do I spray now, uh, spray for the coffee leaf rust so that I can save the plant, but then I compromise. I say, no, the I can't harvest the fruit. I have sprayed, I cannot harvest the crop. So I get a lower uh, yield this year. So that's, those are the decisions that farmers have to make in the field. Uh, either you save your crop or you save your uh, plant. And most farmers will go towards saving the plant because uh, because the plant, it will take another five years. If you lose the plant and you plant something, it's going to take five years before you can get another crop. It sounds like such a volatile lifestyle. It is. Farming is. I mean, not just coffee farming. All farming is very volatile. Where do you think the disconnect lies between... And look, I think I I know know the answer or what you're going to say around this, but I don't think we talk about it nearly enough in the industry. What do you think the disconnect is between the consuming end of this supply chain and the understanding of the volatility that the producer experience? Where's the disconnect? You know, people you know in a in a developed world, they don't see the challenges the farmer faces because they are not out there in the field doing the work and seeing what the farmer has to go through. And so until people experience it, it's really going to be hard for a consumer to really understand because everyone in the morning, you go to the office, the coffee is there. They don't really think about where the coffee is coming from. So I was recently at a, I was giving a talk. I was part of a panel discussion for International Women's Day at Mm -hmm. World Denver and I was talking about almost 70% of the work that is done is by women and, and, and coffee farms. Uh, many, much of the work, the harvesting is done by women. A lot of people don't realize that. Wow. And uh, so, you know, uh, yeah, that is the thing is, I mean, we can educate, but are people willing to learn? And, you know, that is where uh, we are always looking for uh, to buy something cheap in the market. Mm. And there are those uh, certification systems and all of that. That's a whole different topic. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, uh, the sustainability initiatives and all of that. But, you know, you have your local grocery store and then you have Whole Foods, which Whole Foods is organic. I mean, who is willing to pay a premium for a more sustainable crop? So it always yeah. comes to the consumer because everybody is looking for Uh, to buy something uh, which is much cheaper than something else. Right now in the supermarkets here, uh, peppers or capsicums as we call them here are $15 a kilo. Wow. Tomatoes, 
are $10 a kilo. Cuca- and, and it's summer here. It's peak mm. season. Usually these crops are about $3 a kilo. Mm. So we're talking about ravaging inflation. Yes. That is just, I, I wonder, uh, like people are complaining. Why is it $15 to get a capsicum or a pepper? Well, this is what, the, and, and this is not organic. The organic capsicums are about nineteen ninety. Not about they are. They're about twenty dollars. Nineteen ninety a kilo. Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah. It is nuts. It is nuts. You know that that all comes back to supply chain and how right. Yeah, and people complaining about why is it so expensive? That and and I often ask people, do you know where coffee comes from? People are surprised when they find out that coffee comes from a tree mm-hmm. or a plant. And and it goes back to this disconnect between helping people understand what the, the supply chain is and the food source is and that on the other end, for, in order for you to get this, there are hands that touch this that make this possible. Yeah. And I wonder if... It isn't a good thing that we're experiencing this hard time right now so that people can have a little bit more gratitude and understanding about the supply chain and the media has to talk about it more because things are so absurd. The pricing of everything is just so absurd in the supermarkets here right now. It's crazy. Yeah. And then can you imagine somebody who's growing it that they can't even afford to buy what they're growing? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and, but then they're not getting the price. I mean, the $19 that we are paying in the market, the farmer doesn't, they just no. get a small portion of it. No. And this is where we've had guests come on this podcast, producers come on this podcast and say to me, on the cafe end, you're charging $5 a cup. I don't even get that for a pound of my coffee. Mm-hmm. And their expectation is that cafe owners are driving around in Lamborghinis while here on the producing end, they can barely afford to eat. And so when when we go through the process of having that conversation and I explain, you have to understand that cafe owners are barely scraping by. Yeah. Cafe owners, are, uh, if they're lucky, they're making 3% net profit. Yeah. And so producers and cafe owners are mirroring their experience, yeah. both expecting that, well, if I'm not making all the money and the producer's not making all the money, who's making all the all of this money? Which seems to be a big mystery. Yeah, it's a very complicated supply chain. Yeah. You know, coffee and all of the supply chains, you know, it's not directly like you're, produce, you're producing it and it just goes directly to the cafe, but there are so many in between. Yeah. Uh, 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 industry that is uh, controlling on mm. the coffee yeah yeah so okay we've got one episode to go and i want to talk about the future of okay. of coffee um and perhaps we can sprinkle a little bit in there of the role that women are going to play okay in, Sounds good. in the future of coffee all right everyone one episode to go peace love and peanut butter have an amazing rest of your day Thanks friends. If you enjoyed this video, here's what you should check out next. Consider supporting Mapper Forward on Patreon and be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell before you leave.